Welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us for the final presentation for our third and final cohort for the North Coast Innovation Lab. Really excited to share the results of these projects that the project coordinators have been working on for eight and four months. So I'll just give you a brief outline about what we'll get up to today. Uh, we'll start with a traditional welcome from Clarence Nelson Sr. We're going to go into a little bit about what the North Coast Innovation Lab is. We'll get right into our project coordinator presentations. Uh, and then we'll talk a bit about the future of the NCIL and have some final thoughts for you. So without further ado, I give you Clarence Nelson Sr. Well, good morning. It's good to be here and uh, be part, uh, be with the uh, Ecotrust staff. You know, it'd be good to meet and always invite me down for whatever event is going on to, to the uh, Innovation Lab group. You know, congratulations and congratulations to the uh, Ecotrust. I hear they're going to be moving to new quarters. So on behalf of the Chimshan Nation, I'm a hereditary chief, chief Nistoy. Nistoy means I'm grandfather of handshake. And uh, it's always an honor to come and uh, play, a, play a small part in it. And uh, Ecotrust has been, uh, you know, really uh, respectful to, to our nation. And uh, I am, uh, like, I belong to the tribe, Kitful Yolans tribe which means people of the kelp. That's what Gitlo Gilch means. And, uh, and I, I've uh, been around uh, Equitrust for quite a few years. You know, they've been very helpful to me and uh, other people that uh, took on for different projects. And I go back uh, probably uh, when the uh, DFO decided to talk to be, to develop a selective fishery. And Equitrust was the big, played a big part in it and had Fred Hawkshaw and myself build a, they built a, a trap for us to uh, practice some selective fishing. You know, and it was very interesting, but of course it, uh, you know, didn't work out. And, and also over the years, you know, Ecotrust is always involved with uh, gatherings in the fall with, uh, with different uh, groups in uh, Devlin and uh, some facilitators would come to Rupert and we'd have a fall gathering of, uh, of people from different nations, different communities, you know, to, to hear the concerns and what's happening in the industry because, you know, Ecotrust was trying to keep involved in uh, uh, kind of support the, the fishing industry and whatever direction they're taking. So uh, that's why I really, uh, I'm happy to continue to be be around and if they call me down for something like this, I, I, I'm there for them because they were there for us. So to all the staff and Ecotrust, you know, thank you for the opportunity and congratulations on, on all the projects you've been involved in and, and congratulations on the move you're going to make. Thank you. Thank you so much, Clarence, for the traditional welcome and to begin our community presentations. Um, so my name is Nathan and this my is Lexi, Lexi. <laughs> and uh, we are managing the North Coast Innovation Lab which is an initiative of Ecotrust Canada's. Um, now Ecotrust Canada is an enterprising charity that works with rural, remote and indigenous communities towards building an economy that provides for a healthy and resilient environment, sustainable and abundant energy, food and housing, a prosperous and meaningful livelihoods, and vibrant and inclusive cultures. Uh, we call this approach building an economy that provides for life. Our on the ground work and systems approach is entrepreneurial, partnership based, and relentlessly practical. So again, this is us, the North Coast Innovation Lab team, Nathan Randall, the NCIL manager, and myself, Lexi uh, Stevens, who's the NCIL coordinator. And together we, we do our best to learn from the community, learn from our uh, partners, and, and make change in Prince Rupert. We have also received support from Shannon Law, who is the manager of communications and engagement with Ecotrust Canada, and Annalise Chevels, who is from Roots and Rivers Consulting, and has worked with us over the past few years as our developmental evaluator. All right, and we'll just play you a quick little video just to sum up uh, the NCIL to get us going here. Hi, I'm Nathan. And I'm Lexi, and together we manage the Ecotrust Canada's North Coast Innovation Lab. 
The North Coast Innovation Lab is a place-based initiative to encourage collaboration and innovation with community-based organizations and businesses in Prince Rupert. The main way we do that is by partnering with local organizations uh, to bring extra capacity to an innovative project or idea that they have on their books. And we do that by hiring a, a grad student or master student to help them out with that. We are very excited to share with you our third and final cohort of master students and the projects they have been working on with our partners. My name is Carly Tetralik and I'm the Food Security Project Coordinator with EcoTrust Canada's North Coast Innovation Lab and Gitmak Makainiska Society. For me, food is so important because it's really hard to be resilient or to improve other areas of well-being if you're food insecure. So for me, improving people's food security and keeping them interested in local food production is directly a way to improve resiliency. This summer, I've been researching best practices for improving food literacy and food security for NISCA members in Prince Rupert. And then I've also been looking into different models for food distribution. So Gitmak Mackay just recently got a hydroponic unit, which is at Rupert Lawn and Garden. And so I've been looking at how can we get those products out to members and community members in Prince Rupert. In the first cohort, our opportunity was really, we were trying to see how much food could we grow in a greenhouse that wasn't being used to capacity. And now in the second cohort, we've given ourselves permission to think a lot bigger about how can we turn our half acre site into a legitimate food hub there's kind of a misconception in Prince Rupert that it's really hard to garden or it's impossible but as we can see it is possible even with all of the rain. With our biggest challenge being a kind of lack of staffing capacity and specialized knowledge we wouldn't have had the ability to hire Carly without the support of EcoTrust Canada and so to have her expertise, her ability to research um, and, and her more specialized knowledge um, we're able to, to get into deeper into this project than we otherwise would have ourselves that we were able to get together for at least one sort of food-related workshop while I'm here. I think education is so important, so something like our container garden and food security so workshop. You can be eating enough food, but still be food insecure if you're not liking the foods that you're eating. I live on a boat, and eventually when we retire, I want to be self-sufficient on our boat. I do everything on my boat I can, smoke fish, dehydrate, I want to be able to be self-sufficient within three years. I think the joy of knowing that you planted it and then it grew and then you're able to eat it, sort of the, the security and the cost, like, you know, you buy things like asparagus and cauliflower and they're so expensive, right? So it'll be nice to um, actually grow some of the stuff you're going to eat. That's the joy of it. I think with the COVID-19 pandemic, now more than ever, people are really interested in food security and local food production. It's something that's kind of on everyone's mind. I would also love in the future if Prince Rupert could see its own farmer's market, and that's something I'm hoping will continue after I'm gone. My name is Janet Song, and I am the Business Innovation Project Coordinator with the Prince Rupert and District Chamber of Commerce. And this is an organization that has been partnered with EcoTrust Canada's North Coast Innovation Lab. A key project that I have been working on began with facilitating a citywide survey to understand the state of business in Prince Rupert. It helped inform the chamber on the five key challenges of business. First of all, unpacking what does staffing mean? Um, and it means lack of skilled workers, as well as competitive wages, and finally, just lack of human resources to do the work. And finally, other issues such as current consumer habits of buying online. All of the things we are working towards to um, bring our community together, to really support each other, to provide information and help them with innovation, really has become paramount in the new crisis that we're in. The Chamber was able to do programming in a time where many businesses were in the dark and forced to close due to safety regulations of the pandemic. And during that time, that is where the Chamber filled a gap where people were in the dark, they didn't know what to do, and what the Chamber did is they called up all our community partners, government, uh, local organizations together to give updates to the businesses. And these businesses finally got a voice, and they were small businesses who were just talking about what they were unsure of. Janet has brought um, a passion and an insight as a fresh mind to our community of Prince Rupert. She was, you know, paramount in the organization and execution on the weekly COVID conference calls that we've been having. It has really brought 
our business community together in a way that we've never seen before. So her passion for purpose has really helped us uh, engage our membership in a completely different way. We hope to continue our small business task force partnership with the city and tours in Prince Rupert, as well as look into other partnerships with local organizations that we've gathered in our conversation so far, because we need to collaborate to build innovation together. I'm Mary Williams, and I am the project coordinator for a restorative ocean farming pilot project operating through a partnership between the North Coast Innovation Lab at Ecotrust Canada and Coastal Shellfish Corporation. The restorative ocean farming project is scoping the best way to meet local demands for seafood, locally produced seafood that is healthy and affordable, while also building a self-sustaining ocean farm operation that grows different species of kelp, shellfish and potentially more aquatic species in vertical ocean plots. In coastal shellfish, uh, our scallops are a zero input food, which means that there is no food added to the scallops, uh, there is no fresh water, there is no fertilizer, and there's no antibiotics. So we actually grow the food that we're going to feed to the juvenile scallops, the baby scallops as it were, and this is algae. Uh, and it exists in abundance in many places, we've honed in on specific species that really do assist uh, small scallops uh, to, to you know, grow healthy, and this is part of the operation that does that. All challenges start with first steps, and in many ways, the, the steps we're taking now, uh, especially what Mary's doing in putting together community engagement forums and assisting with a wider range of resources out in the world and bringing them to bear on specifically what's happening in our project. Uh, you know, the, the, this is the kind of work that absolutely has to be done. Nothing goes forward without it. So it's a huge, it's a huge benefit to us and ultimately the project. It was nice to have the North Coast Innovation Lab uh, be focused on that, the notion of resiliency and food security, as those are kind of the two most important things on a local level. Climate change, biodiversity loss, and rising food costs will continue to challenge the way we produce and consume foods. Through the restorative ocean farming project, we have the opportunity to get ahead of future food trends and serve as a demonstration for what a sustainable, self-sustaining, and community-based restorative ocean farm could look like. My name is Lori Hammer and I'm an arts-based researcher here on Simshin Territory working with the North Coast Innovation Lab. I've partnered with a group called the Changemakers Education Society and we're working on the Raven Tales Storytelling Project. We bring together youth to talk about and express ourselves through art on reconciliation. The Raven Tales Storytelling Project works toward resiliency in the community because it allows us to hear the voices of youth. It allows us to hear voices that aren't often heard, and it allows us to envision a new way or different ways of seeing how we can get along together and work together to be a stronger community. Oh, okay, yeah. Having Lori with us, she's brought a different kind of creativity to the table. A couple of the programs she set up, there was the possibility to develop creative skills for our youth, and that was online. She also helped us develop relationships in the community and build on those relationships. She came up with some great art projects and ideas that we hadn't thought of before. You know, we hadn't even thought they were a possibility because it was a big ask from the city, that kind of thing. So definitely brought those skills to the table that we hadn't even considered. Reef back in the water. It gets floating down as a little leaf thinking, ah, that didn't work. <laughs> I got to figure a better way. On Saturday at the Creative Storm Outdoor Art Show, uh, you'll be able to see figurines that have been constructed of paper mache uh, that relate to uh, culturally important things that the youth decided we wanted to see. We'll see a lot of painting on rocks uh, that will express different ideas in the show. We also have uh, some beautiful cedar bracelets and talismans that one of our youth have created um, as gifts as a part of the 
exhibition. I see lots of opportunities coming out of this project that will encourage people to use art as a voice, uh, to discover ways to get ideas across that may not be very simple. They're complex ideas, complex feelings, and when you use art to communicate that, uh, you can get a lot out of it and from it. The past three years, the North Coast Innovation Lab have partnered with seven community organizations and businesses and supported 11 master's students working as project coordinators on social innovation initiatives based in Prince Rupert. This work would not be possible without the generous support of our funding partners, namely the Vancouver Foundation, the Government of British Columbia's Rural Dividend Program, the Kerner Foundation, the McConnell Foundation, my Tax Canada, and the City of Prince Rupert. Thank you. So what is the North Coast Innovation Lab? Well, the North Coast Innovation Lab, or NCIL for short, is a place-based initiative for people who are invested in the future of Prince Rupert to prioritize and work together on tangible projects and initiatives that build a resilient economy as a tool for community development. Um, this is a three-year initiative and this is a third and final year um, within Ecotrust Canada, um, but it would be impossible without the support uh, of our financial partners. So the NCIL has received financial support from the Vancouver Foundation, the Kerner Foundation, uh, the Rural Dividend Program, the City of Prince Rupert, uh, My Tax Canada, and the McConnell Foundation. And the NCIL, or North Coast Innovation Lab, has a few focus areas that help to well, focus our work and ensure that we are, uh, are working within our mandate. So our focus areas are how might we grow the local economy for fish and marine products, enhance co-working information and resource sharing, how may we develop social enterprise and entrepreneurship? How could we engage community, in particular youth, in downtown revitalization and placemaking? How can we support food security, literacy, and access in the community? And lastly, how can we enhance the arts and culture economy? These are a lot of focus areas to work on. And you may be wondering, you know, how do we get to these and, and how do we do what we do? And the main way uh, that we add value to the community in these areas is by partnering with local community-based organizations who have um, an initiative or project that they're looking to get off the ground, something that's usually new to them and that they may not have the capacity to fully, fully realize on their own. So enter the NCIL, we partner with them, we work with them to recruit and hire a master's level student. That's where our sponsor, My Tax Canada, comes involved and helps us out with that. And this master student works full time on that initiative or project with that organization. Uh, and that elevates the existing organization and the existing projects that, that are already happening here in Prince Rupert. So um, this is the third year, as you mentioned, of the North Coast Innovation Lab. And we have had several cohorts of students that have moved to Prince Rupert to work as project coordinators with the partner organizations like Lexi mentioned. Uh, last year, we had several partnerships and projects, so we'll just re recap these quite quickly. Um, one partnership and project was with Coastal Shellfish Corporation, and this was exploring growing the local economy for fish and marine products. Another partnership from last year is with Hecate Street Employment Development Society, looking into developing social enterprise and entrepreneurship. Another partner was with Redesign Rupert for the first few months of 2019, um, fo focusing in on downtown revitalization and placemaking projects. And our final partnership from last year was with Gitmak Mackay Nishka Society, looking at exploring food security, literacy, and access within the community. So currently, our, our current projects, we started off with two in January. We started with uh, a project with the Chamber of Commerce in, here in Prince Rupert. And that project focused on uh, enhancing co-working information and resource sharing and also developing social enterprise and entrepreneurship. And then we also partnered with the North Coast Ecology Center Society to develop, or sorry, to engage community, in particular youth, in downtown revitalization and placemaking. 
and also to enhance the arts and culture economy. Now that internship with the North Coast Ecology Centre did wrap up after four months in part due to COVID. Uh, they had a lot of plans for um, public gatherings, events on the weekends, and, and large group meetings and workshops within the community. And with the current climate of COVID, that just wasn't possible. Um, and so we did end that internship uh, halfway through at about April. But then we said, we need some more interns here. Prince Rupert could use some more help. <laughs> So we decided to start another round of recruiting and we hired three more interns to join us from May to September. Mm -hmm. So um, Coastal Shellfish Corporation agreed to be a partner again for another year. So we recruited Mary um, to further explore the local economy for fish and marine products with Coastal Shellfish. Um, the Gimmack Mackay Nishka Society uh, partnered with us again for this cohort. So Carly has been supporting them in looking at food security, access and literacy, uh, challenges and opportunities here. Uh, and Lori uh, has joined the Changemakers Education Society in partnership with the NCIL to uh, look into the arts and culture economy and also look at creative ways to engage youth in this community to explore reconciliation and bring in multimedia and creative projects to uh, explore that. So you may be asking, uh, how did you bring three people from different places in the country safely to Prince Rupert? That's an excellent question. So when we first decided to forge ahead with these internships, you know, after a lot of conversations with, uh, within our internal organization and also with our community partners, we said, you know, these projects should still keep going and we'll just innovate. It's what we do best. We try new things, we learn, and we try again, and we do things from a different perspective and collaborate. And So we decided, let's start these interns working remotely. So they worked remotely for the first two months, May and, July, uh, May and June, and then uh, with the hopes that they would be able to come out here in the summertime later on, and in fact, they did. So uh, in early July, they all traveled from various places in Canada to Prince Rupert. They served a two-week quarantine period, self-isolation, uh, which we supported them through. And then following that uh, isolation period, they were able to work in community and work with their organizations uh, following public health guidelines and the guidelines of their organizations. So we are proud to say that uh, even though it had a bit more of a different start to these internships than we anticipated, we learned that meaningful connections and meaningful work can still happen online remotely and we're super excited that they were able to join us in the beautiful place that we call home here. So, um, without further ado, um, we will begin our presentations. Um, this is a photo of cohort three for the North Coast Innovation Lab. Mary Williams, Lori Hammer, Janet Song, and Carly Tcholek. Uh, we hope that you enjoy these presentations. It's been a pleasure working with this great group of project coordinators uh, and their partners. And um, as the third and final cohort of the North Coast Innovation Lab, um, we want to thank everybody in the community for their support and their interest in uh, the great work that we've been trying to do here in PR. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anthony Ekic. I'm the Executive Director at the Prince Rupert and District Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I am the supervisor for Janet Song, but most importantly, I'm also a friend of Janet Song's. Uh, my time, or her time at the Chamber has been very valuable for us at the chamber, uh, not only capacity-wise, but uh, you know the valuable and uh, innovative ideas that she's brought to the table day in and day out. I'm very glad to have her, uh, and it's sad to see her kind of get, you know the time of her term come up. But uh, we do have plans for her in the future, especially here in Prince Rupert. So we really appreciate all that EcoTrust has done, uh, my tax. Uh, thank you so much to Alexi and Nathan. Uh, but with that being said. I'd like to introduce Janice Song, who is our project coordinator with the Prince Rupert and District Chamber of Commerce. One of the best opportunities in working in Prince Rupert is having the chance to meet and to see the kindness of the community members here and just how they're well, ready to help their neighbors whenever you need them. I had the opportunity of working with a variety of different sizes of businesses, nonprofits, and government service organizations with the aim on how we can build and strengthen our local economy. This looks like how we can put more money into Prince Rupert and how we can increase the quality of life of those who live there. Hi, 
My name is Janet Song, and I am the Prince Rupert and District Chamber of Commerce's Business Innovation Project Coordinator. And this is in partnership with Ecotrust Canada's North Coast Innovation Lab. What I discovered during my time working here is that 50% of the population is Indigenous. And right now, I want to recognize that this meeting is taking place in Coast Simshin territory. You may ask, what is the Chamber of Commerce that I work for? Well, since 1908, it has been serving its business community in supporting them, advocating for them, and connecting them. Additionally, now it operates as a non-profit organization that serves its chamber members of 250, which make up most of the business community as well as other local organizations. Its current services include member advocacy and policy, news communicator through its social media and newsletters, connecting in its community through its networking events, providing resources for its business growth to support business growth support, as well as youth empowerment with its Rising Stars mentorship program connecting youth in this town with industry professionals. It works with a team of board of directors to find ways in how to support the business community. And even though it's been going on for over 100 years, it still tries to find ways to shift and meet the changing needs of the Prince Rupert business community. So here comes the newest addition. Thanks to Ecotrust Canada's North Coast Innovation Lab that connects graduate students like I to community organizations such as the Chamber, I come in tasked with conducting a citywide survey to understand how to conduct um, and understand the needs of the Prince Rupert businesses. Additionally, I will then plan business events informed by the survey results. So I want to share a little bit about myself. I'm born and raised in the big city of Toronto, and I am a master's student in economic development and innovation in the University of Waterloo. And I have developed such a passion on supporting economically and social development initiatives through my research papers in Northern Canadian cities. I discovered that there was such a disparity between the North and South, and I want to understand how can we increase more capacity to support with the skills that I bring from my masters and work with the community on how we can better their livelihoods. So looking at this journey ahead, I was looking with the chamber in how to understand more of the business so we can meet them where they're at. Additionally, respond to uncertainty where it comes and strengthen the partnerships and the programs we provide to support these businesses. And finally, from listening to everyone in this business community, how we can transform ideas into action. First off, we started with a survey to understand the state of business in Prince Rupert. The board of directors and the executive director and I we're working together on creating questions and then I conducted 60 plus interviews. And we wanted to get a holistic perspective by getting 14 industry sectors represented into it. And what we found was the opportunity of business expansion. 70% of our respondents stated that Prince Rupert was an excellent place to do business. But there's also challenges when it comes to running a business. Many people have stated staffing. And after looking into the context of what people said and the frequency, three key things stood out of what staffing means. Number one, the lack of skilled workers in this town. Two, the competitive wages between small business and large industry. And three, just the overall shortage of this labor pool. And other key issues that are restricting the expansion of businesses include the lack of retail traffic with the rise of online buy. Additionally, there's high rental costs to have a shop here in downtown. Three, there's major policy tensions between the business and different levels of government. And finally, there has been some financing uh, operation management issues going on that restrict businesses from expanding. These problems became prominent when businesses were forced to shut down, when staff were afraid to go to work, when food was scarce in the grocery stores, when overhead costs still existed for business owners as they had to pay rent. 
This was when the announcement of the COVID-19 pandemic was announced and business owners were in panic with this uncertainty of how they can manage their stores. And this is where the Chamber of Commerce comes in. Immediately after the announcement, board of directors, Anthony and I, decided to initiate the weekly conference calls to bring everyone together and just share about resources and challenges in one space. The chamber was able to break past physical boundaries to connect. In one of the calls, Dai, a local sushi chef and owner of Fukasaku, brings up the fact that he is low on sushi quality rice and what is he's searching everywhere to find what he needs to start up his business again. And that's when Scott, a local hotel manager from the Crest Hotel, pipes in saying that he has a food supplier and he can order on behalf of Dai. In a matter of days, Dai has his hands on sushi quality rice when he goes to the Crest Hotel with three bulk bags of it. His business can open, he can serve his customer, and his business can survive. This little victory brings so much hope into this small city of Prince Rupert. And it is a reminder that we are better together. The Chamber has risen as a strong voice for the business community. Listening in every week on these calls and we discovered that cost is a huge aspect as revenues have went down and just paying for these costs have been hard. So what the Chamber did is that it formed partnerships with the City of Prince Rupert and Tourism Prince Rupert to form the Small Business Economic Recovery Task Force. Together, we create initiatives where businesses are helped in the best way we can. One of them being a sweepstake contest where anyone who buys local and shares it online so social media, they have a chance to win a $150 gift card to where they bought it from. This brings the community together as a team to how we can support our local businesses. So as you can see, there has been such an operational shift from the Chamber's perspective in usually operating in monthly luncheons and other networking in-person events to digitally engaging its membership. Of course, having its conference calls every week, but also with its social media and newsletters, giving the latest news on what's happening with businesses, as well as letting them know of what has the government been saying or doing on helping businesses. Lastly, we are also trying to expand our capacity by bringing in partners into the line on how we can support businesses together. As you can see, building stronger relationships have blossomed, not only with the Small Business Recovery Task Force, but also with our weekly conference calls. We have invited local experts to showcase their skills to the community, curating content for locals by locals, such as financial literacy, insurance, and so many other topics to equip businesses to be more resilient at this time of uncertainty. Additionally, we also brought in local representatives from the provincial and federal government. They come in and share their updates and live on our platform answer questions of businesses on what to do with their current situation. So as you can see, we've been building up these roundtable discussions where we're having relevant topics that bring and invite people to join in and how and learn how to make their business stronger, such as entrepreneurship, learning about insurance and finance, local procurement and digital marketing. We aim to transform ideas into actions and how that looks like. For example, in one of our local procurement calls, many businesses joined forces and stated, stated that shipping was a major issue as it costs a lot of money and a lot of time to get things up here in the north. So an idea popped up with how about we, as businesses, partner together and fill up a truck and plan out shipping routes. And the chamber can come in by sharing that this was being planned on our newsletters. As you can see, partnerships are just building as we speak in these roundtable discussions. So what does it look like looking forward? 
to the new normal for the chamber? Well, number one, we hope to continue to engage with industry members from changing our monthly luncheons into virtual luncheons, giving them a chance to speak on how they are supporting the local economy to their community. Additionally, secondly, building action plans with our chamber board of directors who are local business leaders on how we can transform the ideas from the round tables into actions that the chamber can help make impact in its community. So the key takeaway is collaboration is key. We are better together when we pool our resources. Additionally, it's so important to have relevant discussion topics on Rupert specific issues. People care about their community and they want to be empowered on how they can take action together with the community on solving some things, as well as putting the human element into, conversa in, into conversations. It's instead of just asking them, how are you, um, like just what you want, you want to say, how are you? Meet them where they're at. And that is building relationship for the long term to help each other in the long term. So I want to conclude saying that we are better together, that we can build economic and social recovery and resiliency together. And we are building an economy that provides for life. So, hi everyone, my name is Blair Miro. I'm the CEO of the Gitmakamakaneska Society. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Carly. Uh, when we first interviewed her back at the start of the year, the world looked a lot different than it did today. And our project on paper, uh, compared to the way that it was actually implemented, looked a lot different. Um, so I'm just very thrilled to introduce Carly because she uh, was such a great partner for us in this project, uh, along with EcoTrust Canada. She was able to roll with the punches as they came, was able to deliver uh, a workshop in person for us to help us pilot what physically distanced programs can look like moving forward as well as helped us advance our agenda to basically build a local food empire. So with that, welcome Carly. Hello, my name is Carly Shachalik and I'm the Food Security Project Coordinator with EcoTrust Canada's North Coast Innovation Lab and Gitmak Makai Niska Society. I'm excited to be here today on Simshin Territory to tell you about the work I've done this summer. So food security, you've probably heard this word quite a bit lately. Um, what does it mean to you? What do you think of when you hear the word food security? What barriers might you or others in your community face uh, to achieving food security? And what foods are really important to you to feeling secure and satisfied? These are all important things to keep in mind when thinking about and working in the food security realm. And so food security is always an important topic, but during COVID-19, more than ever, it's become apparent in our community just how important it is. So here are just a few local news headlines from over the past few months that show this. So we have one here that says, Prince Rupert seniors are often not able to purchase groceries. Another says, BC struggles with local food production in COVID-19 pandemic. Another says, BC imports 99 million kilos of American onions. Why? This reveals the need for local, safe, and reliable food production. And so food security is defined as existing when all people at all times have physical and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food that meets their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. And so we hear the word, like I've said, we hear the word food security quite a bit, but we don't often stop to think, what does this word and what does this definition mean? And so here I've highlighted three areas that I think are really important and that influenced my work this summer. The first is physical and economic access. So this revolved around looking at barriers like food costs and transportation issues. And what it revealed to me is that local food production is so important because it can be reliable, it allows local control of food cost, and it reduces dependence on large retailers. The second is sufficient, safe, and nutritious food. Lots of times food responses can just focus on getting people food, no matter what it is. But being able to access healthy food is really, really important to having sustainable and long-term food security. And then lastly is food preferences. Foods need to be wanted and they need to be culturally appropriate. And so this requires working with the community to understand their needs. And so keeping these things in mind, I worked with Gitmak Makainiska this summer to work on some of their food security projects. Before we dive in deeper, let me talk a little bit about my partner organization. Gitmak Makai Niska Society serves Niska members in Prince Rupert and Port Edward by providing programs and services that aim to improve their overall well-being. Recently, they've been doing a lot of work around food security and this is seen in those programs and services they offer. 
So in response to COVID-19, they offered emergency good food boxes. They regularly distribute salmon to their members, which is a healthy and culturally important food. And then for the past two years, they have brought on graduate students to help build a more food secure community. So in 2019, Morgan Sage, who was the uh, previous food security project coordinator, piloted a project at Rupert Lawn and Garden, which is a social enterprise of Gitmak Makainiska Society, where she planted a bunch of vegetables in large scale container gardens. This project was a huge success uh, because it inspired a desire for local food production, it engaged with members through their harvest, and it showed people that gardening is possible in Prince Rupert despite never ending rain and poor soil quality. However, the project wasn't sustainable from an economic perspective. The cost to uh, run the project far exceeded the profits that could be made from the amount of food that was produced. And so this required a pivot, and this basically is where I came in. So building off of last year, we understood that we needed to be able to increase food access while being able to generate a profit and also improve food literacy because the two are really important that they go hand in hand. Food literacy can be thought of as food education or having the food skills needed to make informed choices surrounding one's diet. This includes things like cooking classes, nutrition workshops, budgeting, gardening, and understanding the more global food system. And so the way we kind of looked at this is through a food hub. And so what a food hub is, in our minds, is a centralized location to leverage our assets that Gitmak Makai Niska Society owns and operates in Prince Rupert. But in short, it's kind of just a one-stop shop to distribute food and offer food workshops, ultimately bettering the food security of members. And so this is the fun part of my presentation, the things I was able to do once I was able to come to Prince Rupert, because for the first two months I was working remotely from Edmonton. And so, as I just mentioned, one of the really important things was engaging through community members through food literacy workshops. Earlier this month, we held a food security and container garden workshop, where we had someone come in from Rupert Lawn and Garden, pictured here, um, to lead a workshop for us. It was really great. Everyone who came was able to take home three plants, and they had the option of planting cucumber, parsley, chives, uh, mustard seeds, and lettuce. And yeah, people had a really, really good time with this. One of my highlights was learning about how to preserve dirt over the winter months, is that you have to bake it in your oven to kill any living organisms in it. We all had a really good chuckle over this, but it also shows the lengths that people in Prince Rupert will go to be able to garden year to year. And so to be honest, we kind of knew that a container garden workshop would be a success because a previous project had been done the year before by Morgan. However, there were a few things we wanted to test this year. The first was that I really wanted to reinforce a focus on food security. And so I started with a presentation similar to this, um, engaging with members to discuss what elements of food security and what foods are really important to them. The second was that it was really important to me to work with a local expert. Um, so that's Mona pictured here. Because I'm hoping that will ensure some longevity to the projects and that workshops like this can continue happening even once I'm gone. The third was that we needed to see if workshops like this could even work during the time of COVID-19. Would people be interested in coming to a workshop in person? And what we found was that people were really positive. Everyone was willing to follow our safety guidelines and the feedback was really great. It also served as an opportunity um, to hear about what future workshops people would be interested in. So there were suggestions like composting and processing traditional plants like Devil's Club. And so that was the food literacy aspect of that food security equa equation. The second part is food access. And so knowing that the container garden model is good for backyard gardeners and your own food production, but knowing that it won't necessarily generate a profit in a smaller scale, Gitmak Makainiska Society has turned to hydroponics. Around the time that I was brought on, they confirmed that they would be receiving a hydroponic growing system in a shipping container like the one pictured here from a company called Grocer. And this has been a really exciting and unique opportunity for me to kind of work around and look into. And so the hydroponic unit is really great because it's reliable, again it allows us to control the cost of the food, um, and it introduces a new resource to the Prince Rupert community. And so within the unit you can produce up to 400 units of produce a week when it's operating at its maximum capacity, and you can grow leafy greens like lettuce, kale, and spinach, as well as herbs like basil, parsley, and cilantro, and microgreens, which are tiny and just packed with nutrients. And so it's already well known, or it's already known in the organization, that the produce from the hydroponic unit will be used at the cafe that will be opening at Rupert Lawn and Garden in the fall, 
and that they'll also hopefully be sold at the Port Ed General Store, which is another social enterprise owned by Gitmak Makainiska Society. But what I looked into was how can we get these products out to members um, through other methods? How can we make sure the costs are as low as possible so people have the most access possible? And so to conclude, I wanted to share a few of the lessons I've learned this summer. The first is to think about longevity from the beginning. As I said, my internship was only four months long and I was only in Prince Rupert for less than half of that. And so for me, from the beginning, thinking about longevity and how this project will continue after I leave was really important. And so that's one of the reasons I wanted to work with Mona from Rupert Lawn and Garden to build a relationship and ensure that workshops can continue when I'm gone. Uh, with Blair, I've also been looking into different grant opportunities and helping them with some applications um, so the food security projects can continue far into the future. The second is that food security is multifaceted. And so I understood this from an academic perspective coming in, but I hadn't really experienced it firsthand. And so for me, this was learning that responses to food security are best when they can draw on many different solutions and come together such as with our food hub model and balancing food literacy and food access. One without the other just would not be as good. And the third lesson is the importance of community-based and locally led interventions. Again, I understood this from an academic perspective, but being in Prince Rupert really made me understand this more. And with COVID-19, it has been increasingly difficult to work with, uh, with and in communities. However, the COVID-19 pandemic has also made it even more apparent that community-led and local interventions are really what are needed. And so this is something that I will continue to value and not take for granted. And so with that, I would like to thank you for tuning in. So thank you very much to Carly and the Gitmak Makai Nishka Society. That was a really awesome presentation. And without further ado, we'll keep going uh, on this presentation train. And I'm going to introduce Karen Buchanan, who's the Executive Director of the Changemakers Education Society. And she's going to introduce our next presentation and intern. Changemakers Education Society was really pleased to welcome Lori Hammer to work with us. Um, <laughs> during this special COVID season um, in delivering our Raven Tale storytelling project. The Raven Tale storytelling project that we've been working on in our community is a youth-based project for young leaders, um, youth age 15 to 30, to have a meaningful impact in our community. We were doing that through exploring um, truth and reconciliation and allowing the youth to share um, their feelings um, of truth and reconciliation through various art projects. Um, I really appreciate Lori's flexibility through this project. It was exceptionally challenging, as you may understand, through COVID in organizing groups of youth to come together and um, share their vision. But we were able to connect with a variety of uh, young leaders who have been developing different passion projects along the lines of truth and reconciliation, so language reclamation, uh, videography, and art. And the entire project culminated in this lovely art show, an outdoor creative storm on a stormy Saturday night in Prince Rupert. Um, yeah, we are sad to see Lori Go. her enthusiasm and creativity in these challenging times was much appreciated as we constantly had to re-envision how to deliver this program. <laughs> and um, we moved on to virtual platforms and connecting in a variety of ways. And it was a wonderful learning experience for all of us as we um, modified our program delivery during COVID times. Again, thank Lori for all of her um, assistance uh, to get this project um, out in our community for people to engage with and begin deeper conversations about um, what truth and reconciliation can really become or what it means in our community and how do we develop pathways to move there. So, really thank you for that. Hello, my name is Lori Hammer. 
I am very grateful to be here on Simshin territory. I recognize that my privilege comes at great expense to the Simshin children, youth, and families. I would like you to watch a short video. So you've just seen an expression, an artistic expression of truth and reconciliation from my perspective. I'd like to flip this around and ask you to imagine what a youth from Prince Rupert might do to artistically express truth and reconciliation. And when you're imagining this youth, I'd like you to think about uh, their personal story. Um, where are they from? Lachlan's? or Hartley Bay, and think about their family. How long have their family lived in this area? Thousands of years? Hundreds of years? Months? Are they newcomers? I'm asking you to think about these things because these personal stories are what's at the heart of the Raven Tales storytelling program. The storytelling program come from? Changemakers Education Society is a nonprofit organization that began here in Prince Rupert in January of 2017. They, are, uh, they offer literacy services, uh, grassroots education, and experiential learning in order to create social change. The executive director, Karen Buchanan, has a very broad spectrum of literacy. What is the meaning of literacy? And creative literacy is an idea, um, something that we can understand as to how we express ourselves, how we share things with others. Uh, computer literacy, how do you work with a machine in order to communicate with others? Um, health literacy, right? What do you know about the health of your body, how you interact with your own body? Emotional literacy, how do you convey those feelings, expressions? How do you work with your own? So with this broad spectrum, this broad understanding of what literacy is, uh, Ms. Buchanan conceived of the idea for the Raven Tales Storytelling Program. And that was to bring youth together to um, uh, think about experiences of reconciliation. And the two goals for the project were um, volunteerism and playmaking, writing a play. And when we think about those goals, we can recognize that youth coming together to talk to one another about their experiences requires collaboration. Collaboration not only on being able to share ideas, but if you're uh, interested in expressing an idea in one mode or one form of art, and somebody is interested in another one, how do those two things collaborate? It's quite a skill to be able to do that, to bring those together and share them and make them work together. 
And then the communication skill involved not only in sharing your ideas with one another, but understanding yourself, self-reflecting, so that you can form that idea and develop it and nurture it to be able to share it with others. That's a big part of communication, the self, the relationship to self. And the, um, oh, sorry, and the social action interaction with each other. So that back and forth that happens, how do we manage ourselves, how do we do that? Building those skills for literacy. So my role as a project coordinator, who am I, what do I do here? Um, my name is Lori Hammer and I am, I'm an arts-based research student with the University of Victoria and I'm in the Child and Youth Care program. I have a background in contemporary dance and what led me to child and youth care was that at a certain point in my career I started working with very young children. Um, I became curious about how um, when children are dancing with improvisation, so they're not being told to move a certain way, they're being asked to express ideas or they're working with a concept, um, how does that support them socially and emotionally? And so social development is a bit of what I just described, how we interact with one another, how we um, uh, are able to read one another, how we uh, uh, share with one another, how comfortable are we with one another. And emotional development is that individual uh, sense of self and also how you regulate your emotions. How do you soothe yourself? How do you motivate yourself? How do you, you know, move through and navigate things? So those ideas inspired me a lot. I felt that dance had a lot to offer, particularly when I was seeing how preschoolers worked with one another. So um, at the university, at the Child and Youth Care program, there is a uh, focus on how child and youth care workers work within indigenous communities. And in particular, what actions are they taking to move toward reconciliation? How are they decolonializing the system that they're working in? So that became an important part of my work in understanding how dance can support human development. And I um, began to connect to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's Calls to Action, uh, which asks artists to collaborate in moving toward reconciliation. So imagine my surprise and my delight when I heard that there's a program that exists outside of the academy that's doing all of those things, and that is the Raven's Tales Storytelling Program. Um, and it had begun last year in March of 2019, and the North Coast Innovation Lab from EcoTrust put out a call to master's students to come and be an intern for four months to work with the program. So I have been very blessed and very lucky to come and work with changemakers uh, to support the program for this time, for this length of time. Uh, it's a socially innovative program. It allows youth's voices to be heard, um, and it's uh, it's place-based. It's you know it's happening in this community. So I've had an opportunity to not only work with youth and understand what they think about and what they believe in but also understanding a community that, that they're working in. That's been a big part of the research here as well. Um, so one of the things that uh, you've probably heard about from everybody <laughs> is the time of the pandemic. And I was very appreciative of my collaboration with uh, Karen Buchanan because we looked at it and we said, let's try and make this a parameter, not a constriction. And so online technology is like, what can we do with this? How can we, you know, how can we embrace this? What can we create with this? And we decided to explore outdoor spaces. We thought we can't be asking people to come together indoors to, to write a play or work out a play or, you know, do scene making, that kind of thing. So we're gonna go outside and see what happens there. And so we spent the month of June um, uh, online with people through Zoom calls. Uh, asking them to go out with their their cameras and uh, looking at the spaces that they're in and how do those spaces um, inspire them and what do those spaces mean to them personally and uh, when you start thinking about those spaces how do you create the space do you do something to it do you move things around do you draw on it do you you know uh, is your movement creating changing the space somehow 
and also the space itself as it is, this piece of land that you're standing on. What is your relationship to that piece of land and what does that mean? Especially when we start looking at the idea of moving toward reconciliation and the understanding you have for that. So all of these ideas came together and um, we created a show that just happened two days ago actually uh, called the Creative Storm Outdoor Art Show. And this particular image uh, is from the very first uh, installation that people would come upon. And what you see in the foreground are um, cedar bracelets with devil's club beads on them. You'll probably notice that I'm actually wearing one. <laughs> Um, and in behind, it might be difficult to see on the, in the slide, but there is a video that's being shown. So talking with the youth, deciding what this installation meant, what is the theme of this, it was uh, decided to be truth and reconciliation. So in the video, we chose a lot of the work that we had been doing throughout the summer that reflects ideas on how you move toward truth and reconciliation. So there's uh, an elder speaking about the Raven Brings the Light story. Um, there's a, a totem pole carving project going on. Um, can't remember what else is in the video right now. And uh, the reason for the cedar and the devil's club beads is that the youth were talking about what's needed, what is needed right now in this time of truth and reconciliation. And the word that they came up with was healing. Healing is very important for everybody involved. And so they chose these materials because they are um, used for healing purposes. And they offered them as gifts to everyone who came. And that's why the installation is hanging in that way, so that participants could come and receive their own healing gift. Um, so I came up with some questions about the program to try and be able to tell you more about the program. And so one question I often get asked is what were the challenges with the program besides the pandemic? Um, and I think that uh, uh, participation, particularly with this age group with youth, is a, a challenge, never mind with COVID or not. Um, I mean, that fed into it and of course the changing of school, being in school and out of school also affected that. But I think a, a strong thing that I've learned is that youth aren't, uh, as they get older, there's less and less um, room. Children are often given space to be heard, and as you get a bit older, there seems to be less spaces to hear your voice. And I think one of the things that I love the most about this program is that it's so focused on that and on creating space for those voices. So what did I like besides the space for the voices? Um, I really appreciated in the time that I was here that in June we did the programming where we were um, you know, working through Zoom one-on-one -on -one with people and getting them to go out and reflect on things and do things creating art. And then in the month of July, we moved into um, connecting with community members. There are many, many community members who really strongly support the Raven Tales program. And so uh, we connected with um, Lyle Campbell, and he was, he's been building, uh, carving a, a totem pole, a memorial pole for his mother since uh, April, I believe. And um, we had the good opportunity to be able to go down there once a week for the month of July. And uh, Lyle is extremely generous with his cultural understanding and his um, sharing of the, the meaning of things, his emotional response to things, as were all of the carvers there. Um, so it was an extraordinary experience for not only myself, but the youth, and I really got to see how um, bringing their artwork, bringing their connection to what they're doing, how they're capturing this, this pole carving um, project, um, gave them a different grounding than only speaking about their story and their relationship to land, because they now had a broader support, a broader understanding of who they are. So it was... Uh, one of the things I liked a lot. And my last question was, um, oh, what did I learn? Thank you. <laughs> so what did I learn? What I learned was uh, how to step back and uh, facilitate without um, uh, bringing in my inspiration and my intuition for you know what this project can be or what it could look like. 
and stepping back and making space again for, for youth voices. And I brought this photo up because uh, one of the, another installation at the Outdoor Art Show was um, titled uh, Gratitude Rocks. And um, we had uh, youth expressing uh, ideas of gratitude through these paintings. And uh, we also had a uh, written piece of paper that was wrapped up and hanging from trees for people to take with them, which had uh, the writing that a youth had done that really clearly described her, for where she is in her life, what gratitude means to her. And as we were going through all of this, um, there were many things I wanted to add and contribute, but I recognized that there was a process going on that I was not a part of. Um, I was definitely there to support and facilitate, but um, that was a very, very big learning for me. So um, for the future, I'm thinking that the, the strength of this program, the incredible strength of this program has room and potential to grow. Um, there could be uh, culturally appropriate um, emotional supports brought into the program, which would uh, support youth to go even deeper into this very complex and sometimes challenging um, subject of truth and reconciliation. And uh, I, I, I just feel like the, the program has promised to go on and on if it, if it wants to. Um, this, oh, this is the photo of the, uh, I was telling you about the scrolls or the writing of the youth who was explaining what gratitude is. And um, that is my presentation. I really appreciate being able to communicate all of this with you. If you have any questions about the program, I urge you to contact me at this uh, email address or look us up on social media. That was a big part of our program as well, was uh, reaching out to you through social media. So Facebook, Instagram, you can find us there quite easily. Uh, you can also call the Changemakers office. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lori. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce our next presentation um, and presenter, which is Mary Williams. But first, I'd like to introduce the CEO of Coastal Shellfish Corporation and the supervisor for this project, Michael Uehara, to say a few words and to welcome Mary Williams for her presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Nathan. Uh, I'm not as uh, good at being spontaneous. So I've written a few notes. Uh, I think Mary, if you look at Mary's CV, she came to uh, this community and this job uh, kind of at a perfect time in, in her development and a perfect time for us. She has a specific interest in aquaculture and indigenous resource management, which really fit us quite well. If I had to summarize how particularly indigenous communities proactively manage resources for a changing world, I wouldn't be able to. And I think that's where Mary's study comes in too, who is uh, somebody who has looked at that and really given us a perspective that's created a great deal of value as we go forward with this project. Whether that change is climate change, market change, legal framework change, or even global changes by, brought on by a pandemic, how do managerial logics respond to a changing world? In a sense, the restorative ocean project we are working on with the North Coast Innovation Lab is about creating the change we wish to see, to coin a phrase. It's about, in a sense, taking advantage of some of those changes and responding to others. It is about, as Mary framed it, getting ahead of the curve. Perhaps the most significant impact in this COVID era is the way time and connections have been truncated. In spite of these unprecedented limitations, Mary, with a rare combination of diligence, intelligence, and passion, has contributed mightily to this and us getting ahead of the curve. And so with that, Mary. As I gratefully stand on unceded Coast Simpson territories, I'd like to begin my presentation by asking a few questions that I want you to keep in the back of your mind as I'm talking with you today. What's green and grows in abundance in Canada and has a strong and distinct smell that you might notice a lot around here and has a variety of uses and applications, including medical? Kelp! Can you laugh track, please? Um, I thought I'd start with a joke. You'll see why in a couple minutes. 
Um, but on to the actual questions that I really would like you to keep in your mind throughout this presentation. I'd like you to imagine you're desert on a deserted island and you have to produce your own food. Where does your mind go? What foods would you want to produce? What tools would you need? What weather would be ideal? What food is reliable, sustainable, and nutrient rich? What food gives back to the health of your island? What food is fulfilling and brings you joy? There have been thousands of famines over history and food challenges will only continue to grow as the symptoms of climate change escalate. Monoculture continues to deplete the soil we grow from. There are predictions that our oceans will be empty by the year 2050 and food will become less accessible as the price of land, transportation, feed, pesticides and other food common food inputs continue to rise. Global warming and changing weather patterns will pose continuous threats to the reliability of commonly practiced food production methods and harvesting methods, which means we need to start challenging our business as usual approach right now. I'm Mary Williams, and you might wish that I had another joke. I don't, but I am that much closer to talking about an exciting project that I've been working on this summer. I am the project coordinator on a restorative ocean farming project operating through a partnership between the North Coast Innovation Lab at Ecotrust Canada and Coastal Shellfish Corporation, building on the great work that the previous project coordinator did last year, Taylor Riedlinger. And I want to thank you all for tuning in with us today. Through this project, we're looking at ways to farm what I believe will be the foods of the future that help protect and even heal our ocean while addressing some local food challenges experienced right here in Prince Rupert. Prince Rupert is located on the beautiful Coast Simpson territories right next to the ocean, yet a prevalent issue identified by the NCIL during its inception in 2018 was reliable access to affordable seafood through formal networks, despite the town and region's deep fruits and fisheries. Traditional harvesting systems have provided much more than sustenance for Coast Simpson people for thousands of years, with abundant access to healthy and dynamic foods like sockeye, seal, abalone, seaweed, and ulican. Yet these systems have been disrupted by the history and ongoing legacy of colonialism, among other challenges. Climate change, industrial activity, and other social, economic, and political conditions have diminished the ability of residents to rely on the food that the lands and the waters have to offer in these altered physical and regulatory environments. Much of the seafood that is caught locally simply passes through Prince Rupert on its way to its end destination elsewhere, and the food that can be bought here is expensive and coming from further and further away. Coastal Shellfish was started in 2011 as a primarily First Nations owned scallop farming operation in which Metlakatla First Nation are the majority shareholders. Through the restorative ocean farming project, we're piloting the best ways to enhance the local seafood market through growing sustainable, healthy, and desired foods that can enhance seafood security. So what is restorative ocean farming? Restorative ocean farming is an innovative approach to aquaculture or growing foods in our great seas instead of the land. We're looking at farming multiple species instead of one, which makes the farm less vulnerable to disease and crises. Instead of choosing the foods we grow based solely on marketability and profitability, we're letting social, environmental, and economic principles guide the development of the farm. Some restorative ocean farmers even claim that the best fishing can be found directly around their farm site. We'll create many ecosystems through growing various plant and animal species in vertical ocean plots. Um, and these species complement one another while also enhancing surrounding e ocean ecosystem health. Right now we're looking at farming scallops, oysters, and a couple species of kelp with the potential to farm and hope to farm more species in the future. So what would a restorative ocean farm look like? A lot like coastal shellfish's existing scallop farms that you may have seen the buoys out in the water for meaning it really doesn't look like much. However, what's under the surface may or may not surprise you. The farm will look a little something like this, um, using long lines in the entire water column to produce an abundance of food while requiring minimal space and remaining largely invisible, which is really ideal in a stunning environment like this. So why kelp and shellfish? Coastal shellfish already has an established scallop hatchery and commercial avenues for selling scallop products. Five scallops have over 100 healthy calories, an abundance of omegas, and over 20 grams of protein. Coastal shellfish has already also been testing the ideal conditions to grow um, oyster seeds and could supply seeds to the future farm. But the benefits go beyond food security. 
Shellfish help filter the ocean of excess nutrients and pollutants, meaning they really just help clean the ocean. One oyster can filter up to 50 gallons of water a day. While kelp and kelp forests act as an important source of food, spawning, and habitat in underwater ecosystems, and help sequester carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus, which helps keep the ocean from becoming too acidic to support life. Kelp also has substantial nutritional benefits, with a higher calcium concentration than milk, and being a rich source of iron, iodine, vitamin C, and more. However, all of this considered, all kelp has right now is a lot of potential. I want you to think of the questions I asked you just a few moments ago. We're on a struggling planet. There's a food that helps protect our ecosystems while enhancing our health. And while kelp has been an important food in several Asian countries and indigenous cultures for thousands of years, many of us wouldn't consider eating it despite the diversity of ways in which it can be consumed. Like kelp flakes, which can be added to meals to add a little bit of flavor while also serving as a healthy salt substitute. And that's where I come in. Kelp is one of the fastest growing organisms on the planet and the future farm will produce tons of it every year whether we want it to or not. So one of my major tasks this summer was researching the local and overall Canadian kelp market to find kelp placements for kelp products at the rate in which this impressive sea vegetable grows. Luckily kelp has a variety of non-food uses like biofuels, plastic alternatives, health and beauty products and more. But growing and processing kelp for these uses and accessing these markets is difficult, timely, expensive, and requires a lot of space. But there are a few simpler uses for kelp that can also be used to address local food security, like selling kelp for it to be used in fertilizers, which helps add vital nutrients to the soils to help aid in local food security projects. We could also look at selling kelp for kelp restoration projects to help replenish the loss of wild kelp forests and accessing local niche markets like the row one kelp industry. Another large challenge in this project is finding um, a structure and model for food distribution that actually enhances the local seafood market rather than reproducing the current dynamics of accessing seafood in Prince Rupert. This project was started in January 2019 with a few organizations taking an advisory role, Ecotrust Canada, Coastal Shellfish Corporation, and Metlakatla Stewardship Society. The project was started with the intent of creating a restorative ocean farm to reclaim the sustaining properties of the ocean in Metlakatla territory for Metlakatla First Nation, enhancing food security, environmental restoration, and territorial stewardship. However, there are many moving pieces in a project of this nature, and without re adequate research and development, we risk building an operation that will pose a big burden on the community if it can't be sustained. One of the options we've been considering doing here is starting a community-supported aquaculture operation, which means that people and businesses will buy shares in the farm at the beginning of each year or harvesting season, and in return, they'll receive a set amount of seaweed each week or month to be picked up at a set location or delivered to them. This community-supported farm could serve as a demonstration of the feasibility and costs associated with running a successful restorative ocean farming project. However, this alone will not address food security. As Carly mentioned, food security encompasses so much more than just producing and providing food. And while there is no perfect food security project, it involves the species grown, how they're grown, who produces the food, how the food can be accessed by the community, and more. To help address local food security in Matlakatla and Prince Rupert, more work needs to be done engaging with the community. And scoping the different options and desires for a food security program and its related benefits, like jobs. We're looking at a couple of different options, which may include community organizations buying a number of seafood shares in the farm, and that seafood can then be distributed weekly or monthly through a community food program. Another option is potentially starting a second farm once the success of the first farm is proven, where half of the food produced will be provided to the community at a discounted rate, which will be financed by selling the rest of the food through traditional commercial means. What's great about these different options in the restorative ocean farming model is its flexibility and adaptability. We could look at using the farm sites and the food program as ways to offer ecological and food education programs. We could also look at collaborating with other organizations and communities with a similar mission. We also hope to farm more seafoods in the future that are locally desired but might not have a large market elsewhere, like cockles, sea cucumbers, and urchins. The world really is our oyster. But as I mentioned in the beginning of my presentation, the environment is changing and food security challenges will only grow unless we start challenging the business-as-usual approach right now. 
I've been very grateful for my brief stay here in Prince Rupert, the people I've met, and to work on such an inspiring project, which I believe will serve as a demonstration of the farms of the future for the foods of the future. And on that cheesy note, I would like to flip another cheesy saying around and say the oyster is our world. And on that note, thanks for listening, and please do not hesitate to contact me if you have any questions. Right. Well, thank you so much to Mary for the informative presentation about restorative ocean farming. Um, that was, concludes the end of our NCIL Cohort 3 Project Coordinator presentations. And uh, you may be wondering, well, what's next for the NCIL? We keep saying, you know, third and final cohort for the North Coast Innovation Lab. And, and what does that mean for the NCIL? Where are we going to go from here? Um, that's a great question. <laughs> and. Um, where we're headed from here is we have learned a lot over the past three years. We want to take what's worked really well um, from the past three years. And among many of our projects, you may have noticed that there's a bit of a theme around food and food systems and food security. So we're going to double down on that and explore um, making Prince Rupert a better place through food security and food systems. So we're working right now on fundraising to get some money so that we can work for the next few years around food security and food systems, uh, specifically in Prince Rupert, but also around the whole Northwest region as well. Um, something about how can we get people from different places to talk to each other around food and distribution from you know Smithers to Haidagua and seafood from here over to Smithers and, and that kind of thing and, and how we can build this uh, wonderful food network that we already have here, but how can we enhance that uh, and elevate it to, to be even better? So that's what's coming up for the North Coast Innovation Lab. It may have a different name. You may see us under a different name starting next year, uh, but it'll be the same same faces uh, running it, and uh, and we're really excited to see where this next uh, next chapter takes us. And of course, this work would be impossible without the support of all of our partners, we, we've had so many, whether it's been a funding organization or institution, a uh, business in the community, a local non-for-profit, we have been so fortunate to collaborate with so many different organizations over the past few years. So I'd like to give a shout out to those who have supported us with the latest cohort uh, and this year of the North Coast Innovation Lab, uh, MyTax Accelerate, uh, the Vancouver Foundation, the McConnell Foundation, specifically their Interweave program for evaluation, Changemakers Education Society, the Kerner Foundation, uh, the BC Rural Dividend Program from the uh, province of BC, uh, the North Coast Ecology Center Society, uh, the Prince Rupert and District Chamber of Commerce, the Gitmak Mackay Nishka Society, Coastal Shellfish Corporation, and we give our thanks as well to the City of Prince Rupert. Thank you all so much for your support and your partnership over the past few years and especially with the latest cohort. Thank you all so much for joining us. We really appreciate you uh, joining us for this um, innovative, unconventional way to share our, our projects out from this past summer. And uh, thank you so much for your support and uh, being present with us this evening. And if you have any questions about uh, North Coast Innovation Lab, Ecotrust Canada, or about any one of the presentations that you saw uh, here today, you can contact myself, Lexi, or Nathan just by emailing us at Ecotrust Canada, alexi at ecotrust.ca, or nathan at ecotrust.ca, or you can call our office at 250-624-4191, and we'd be super happy to chat with you about uh, any of your questions and, and more about what's in store for the NCIL in the future and anything like that. Lastly, just a little bit about Ecotrust Canada, if you don't know. Uh, Ecotrust Canada is an enterprising charity that works with rural, remote, and indigenous communities toward building an economy that provides for a healthy and resilient natural environment, sustainable and abundant energy, food, and housing, prosperous and meaningful livelihoods, and vibrant and inclusive cultures. We call this approach building an economy that provides for life. Our on-the-ground work and systems approach is the entrepreneurial, partnership-based, and relentlessly practical. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.